tonight. My heart is full and overflowing. Exodus chapter 23, verses 20 through 26, all the way back there in the Old Testament. Second book, Genesis, then Exodus. 23 and verse 20. Behold, I send an angel before thee to keep thee in the way and bring thee into the place which I have prepared. Beware of him. Obey his voice. Provoke him not. He will not pardon your transgressions, for my name is in him. But if thou shalt indeed obey his voice and do all that I speak, then I will be an enemy to thine enemies and an adversary to thine adversaries. For my angel shall go before thee and bring thee in unto thee. This is the overcoming of their enemies. Amorites and Hittites and Perizzites and Canaanites and Hivites and Jebusites and all the other rites. And I will cut them off, but thou shalt not bow down to their gods, nor serve them, nor do after their works, but thou shalt utterly overthrow them and quite break down their images, and ye shall serve the Lord your God, and he shall bless thy bread and thy water, and I will take sickness away from the midst of thee, and there shall none cast their young nor be barren in the land. The number of the days I will fulfill. I want to take a little time tonight and talk to you about the ministry of angels and the assistance that I believe God is arranging, assigning, and releasing to the church for these times in which we live. Would you pray together with me right now? Lord, I pray tonight that you would encourage us, instruct us, lift our faith, bring holy boldness upon us, help us understand, Lord, the great power and anointing and blessing that you have for us. Help us see the big picture. Help us understand it in a spiritual way and not just an intellectual or emotional way. And we'll give you all the praise and glory. And everybody said, in Jesus' name. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. We arrive at this particular scripture. And as we read it, this is actually God speaking to Moses on the mountain. And Moses is receiving instructions from God specifically on how it is they will possess the land. And in that conversation, God explains, I'm going to send an angel. The angel is going to go before you. And the angel will bring you into the land. Then explaining how they will overcome all of the adversaries of that land. As we read that kind of a scenario, we look at it tonight with a sense of expectation and prophetic understanding because I believe you and I stand in a similar place as Moses did. He was about to possess the promised land that God had promised unto them, unto Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, would be the promise of God's land. And here we are as the end time church, and I believe we are ready to possess the promise of end time revival. I believe we're entering the time of the latter rain. I believe we're seeing the culmination of end time events with world government and world religion and a world economic system and the spirit of antichrist. But we look with an understanding that in the last day saith God, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh. There is going to be a magnificent, monumental, unbelievable end time harvest. Well, that should excite you a little more than that. And I'll tell you why. You should all be excited about what we call harvest or revival or new people being saved, especially in your church. And I'll tell you the reason why. Because when people start walking through these doors, coming and sitting in these chairs, praying in these altars, getting baptized in that baptistry, 
attending these Sunday school classes, you know, those people are going to be your family, your friends, your co-workers, people you've been teaching, talking to, praying for, your neighbors. It's going to be this community right around here where you live that is going to have that great revival. It's going to be supernatural. A while back, I was praying, especially during the pandemic, trying to figure out how in the world are we going to reach the lost when we can't even talk to people, knock on their door, they think you're trying to kill them. If you cough on an airplane, they're about ready to throw you out the emergency door. I said, everybody's got hypersensitive about contact and conversation. And the Lord began to deal with me. First of all, let me know this wouldn't stay that way forever. It would pass and opportunities would come again. But then he reminded me that as the days of Noah were, so shall it be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. And I got to thinking about Noah and how it was that Noah got all those animals into the ark. It doesn't seem he went out with a rope. Doesn't seem he laid traps. Doesn't look like he even left the ark at all. It looked like he built the ark. He prepared, got everything in place, made sure everything was ready. And then he opened the door, and then something invisible happened. Out there in the animal kingdom, something that nobody could have anticipated, I believe the Spirit of God began to move on certain animals, and there was a flock of sheep down by the watering hole, and two of them felt something that the others didn't feel, poked up their heads and made their way toward the ark. While all the hippos were down there sopping around in the mud, Two of them poked their head up through the water and started lumbering their way to the ark. All the giraffes over there nibbling leaves off the trees, two of them stopped nibbling and started walking toward the ark. It was like instinctively something went out in the animal kingdom and they began to come in. See, I got to looking to try to figure out how it all happened and the only thing I found in the Bible is Genesis 7, 16. This is God's full explanation of Noah and his ark. And they that went in, went in. That's all you get. That's the entire Bible explanation of Noah and the ark. Because I believe that Spirit of God captivated them and drew them. And I'm telling you that in these last days, there are going to be people that are drawn by the Spirit of God. They're going to drive by this church and they don't know why, but they feel like we just need to go check those people out. They're going to be invited by somebody, and although they haven't really wanted to go to church before or said no many times, suddenly they're going to say yes, maybe not even understanding why they did. And they'll come. The backsliders are coming. The unconverted are coming. People from every denomination are coming. God's going to begin to draw. It's going to be just like the days of Noah. We better be getting ready. No, I don't think you're hearing me. I said, we better be like Noah. We better be building and preparing and gathering and getting ready. Because when they start gathering outside these doors, uh, we better know what to do. We're going to need some Bible teachers. We're going to need some prayer warriors. We're going to need somebody that knows how to lay hands on somebody and pray with them till they receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost. We're going to need people that are, know how to baptize folks in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're going to need people with faith that can lay hands on people and they can receive a healing and a deliverance and cast out devils because they're going to come. God's going to draw them and they're coming out of every walk of life. They're coming out of every culture. They're going to come rich. They're going to come poor. They're going to come educated. They're going to come uneducated. They're going to come with religious background. They're going to come with no religious background. They're coming from every place. You better get ready. Some of your family members that you thought would never be saved, they're going to be saved. They're going to be part of this end time revival. 
We better learn how to pray for people over the telephone. We better learn how to use that Zoom and FaceTime for something more than gossip. Amen. And know how to pray with people over the phone. What are you going to do when one of your relatives calls you about 1 o'clock in the morning and say, man, something's happening to me I don't understand, but you got to pray with me right now. You want to have been to the prayer meeting at church for a while. You want to have been part of the prayer team so you know how to pray. You don't want to be stumbling and bumbling when one of your family members needs prayer in the middle of the night. You want to say, let's touch God. I know how to pray. You pray along with me. This is how it's going to work. I'm telling you, we're going to pray them through over the phone. We're going to pray them through over the internet. We're going to be ministering in every kind of direction. You better learn how to take somebody by the hand and pray with them in the power of the Holy Ghost. Oh, would you give the Lord a great big hand, praise. All right, Al. I'll settle down, kind of get with you here tonight, sorry. There's going to be a spiritual work of the five-fold ministry. God is raising up apostles and prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers, specifically designed for this end time. Yeah, be spooky about it all you want to, it's coming. So just get ready. We get all nervous if somebody's called a prophet. We get more nervous if somebody's called an apostle. We better get over our nervousness because God's sending apostles and prophets because we're going to need them for this end time revival. They're not going to assert the authority of the pastor in the local church. Pastor's still going to be pastor. He's going to be the authority in the local church. But the apostles and prophets are going to come beside and they're going to lift up the arms of the pastor. They're going to enter into the harvest field. They're going to use their unique anointing and gifting and ability to be a blessing and to provide some areas. And we're all going to work together in unity and in harmony. The gifts of the Spirit are going to be in operation. Well, get nervous again. They're going to be prophesying and words of knowledge and words of wisdom and discerning of spirit, tongues and interpretation of tongues. We're going to see the gift of faith and miracles and healings and operation more than we've ever seen it before in the church. Well, I may as well get off into the deep waters. I believe dreams are going to increase. Visions are going to increase. I thought y'all's name on y'all's church said apostolic. Y'all acting like I'm teaching stuff you never heard of here before. Dreams and visions and signs. Signs. We've been so negative about signs for so long, we don't even believe in signs anymore. But that's in the Bible. Now, we don't go seeking after a sign, but we ought to have enough sensitivity to recognize one when it happens. Now, a sign is different than a fleece. You don't create the conditions of the sign. If Brother Klein did steps two feet to the right, puts the microphone in his right hand, takes his glasses off, then I know I need to pray. Well, you need to pray whichever direction I walk up here. Hallelujah. You don't, you don't create fleeces and set out situations of context like that, but when God gives you a sign, you need to be spiritual enough to understand it. Now, for many years, if, if a pastor preached on Sunday night, took a certain text, preached a certain topic, and then a guest minister come, an evangelist or a missionary come on Wednesday night or the next Sunday night, preach the same topic, the same sermon, same scripture. We all go, ooh, God's speaking to us. It's a sign because what is the, what is the mathematical probability that two ministers are going to take the same text or the same word in such a short amount of time? And at least we're wise enough to realize, okay, God is trying to get our attention. That's what a sign is. It's a little pointing in the right direction. For many years, my wife and I, when we're making very serious decisions, when we are trying to get the direction of the Lord, and we feel like maybe we have it, we feel like we've zeroed in, and we start looking for confirmation, there has been a sign, this, this is one of many, but I'll tell you this one, a sign that has shown up to us through the years, and it is two doves, two doves will show up. And they'll just land on something nearby. They've landed on uh, our back deck. They've landed on the car. They've landed on a tree branch close by. We've been walking through a park, and they just land on the, on the fence post or something. And it's uncanny that just at these very critical moments, 
when we are the most searching for some confirmation that this sign will show up. And that's all it is. We don't talk to the doves. We don't name them. We just say, okay, this is God's little signal to us that we've learned through the years has put us on the right direction. There's going to, we need to get very aware of how to see the visions of God, discern the dreams that God gives us, recognize the signs and wonders and miracles when they happen. And tonight, I want to remind us that another of the powerful end time powers is going to be angelic visitations. God bless one person over here who believes in it. Praise the Lord. <laughs> you know I'm just teasing y'all. <laughs> Amen. That brother was up here preaching, doing such a good job here tonight. I was over here. I said, I said, brother, I'm picking up what you're putting down. Hallelujah. Amen. Now I'll let you listen here because I want to, I want to give you some biblical knowledge so you don't think I'm just out there, you know, in spooky land. Because I believe ministry of angels is going to assist the church in this critical mission of the end time harvest. The title angel or angels is in the Bible 273 times, the King James Version. The term is brought to us from the Greek word angelos. It means a messenger. So what's an angel? A messenger, an envoy, an ambassador, one who brings good tidings, one who is sent from God. Do you know that in the Bible even pastors are referred to in the context of the angel as one that is sent from the Lord to the church. The Hebrew word for angel is malak. It means messenger. This speaks of one being sent by God, such as an angelic being, even a prophet or a priest or a teacher, and they are defined as messengers, ambassadors of a king. They are sent to bring us information from on high. So both the Hebrew and the Greek words are applicable to both individuals that are sent by God with God's supernatural power and angelic beings that are invisible but come to us from that invisible world. As a matter of fact, that Hebrew word malak is where we understand the prophet Malachi. Malachi is from the, Greek, uh, the Hebrew word malak. It simply means a messenger. So the conclusion of that matter is angels are messengers from God. They are invisible agents. They are invisible emissaries from the kingdom of God. They serve the Lord and they help the church. Why don't we give the Lord a great hand praise for that right there. That's, I'm going to tell you that's some good news when you need it. They are invisible inhabitants of the kingdom of light. You know there's a kingdom of light and there's a kingdom of darkness. Now if I talk to you all about the demons and the devils, we'd all be just ready to learn. And we need to learn. We need to know about what's going on in that spirit world. We need to know what we're up against and what we're battling. We also need to know that there's help from on high. There are inhabitants of the kingdom of light. The Bible talks to us about cherubims in the book of Genesis and in Ezekiel. These living creatures with two pairs of wings and four faces. and They're guardians of the throne of God. I've never seen one. I got a feeling I'd be just a little bit nervous if I did. Showing up with four faces, I'd have to kind of check my glasses, make sure they're in focus. The book of Revelation chapter 4 talks about these living creatures. they very different from one another, yet they face one another. And they seem to be specifically assigned to the throne of God. The cherubims in Scripture seem to be used in guarding capacities. They're delegated with spiritual authority from God. They are God's delegated agents of power and guardians. Now, this might be a good place to insert. God does not need any bodyguards. He doesn't need any angels protecting his throne. He doesn't need any angels doing anything, really. He can do it all himself. 
So God in his own determination and decision and decided that he was going to distribute his power, send forth his word, and do his work through angelic beings and through ministers that are now in the church. So therefore, we do not worship angels. They're simply God's ambassadors. We are uniquely marveled by their existence and their visitation, but we do not worship angels. We only worship God. But we are very thankful for their assistance when they show up to help us from the Lord. In the Garden of Eden in Genesis 3, 24, when God drove man out of the garden, he placed in the east of the garden cherubim with a flaming sword to turn every way and keep guard over the tree of life. So here a cherubim also is in a guarding sense. Another place you'll find this cherubim is over the mercy seat. In Exodus 25, 22, there I will meet with thee. I will commune with thee above the mercy seat from between the two cherubims which are upon the ark of the testimony. And that excites me, Pastor, to think about that ark of the covenant with that mercy seat on top where the blood would be sprinkled and then there the fire would fall and consume that blood sacrifice and receive humankind, would receive atonement and forgiveness of sin in the Old Testament covenant. And in the New Testament covenant, we come before the mercy seat when we come and repent of our sin. And we ask God to forgive us of our sin. And we come to the foot of the old rugged cross. And, there, and we ask the Lord to let his blood cover us and receive us. And what I like about that is the Lord's letting us know there are cherubims guarding the mercy seat which means anyone who comes running, anyone who comes looking, anyone who tries to get repentance, there's no devil in hell that can stop somebody that wants to repent of their sin. The cherubims are guarding the mercy seat of God. They're making sure access will always be granted. <laughs> Woo! God said, I'm going to put my angels there to make sure you always have access to his mercy. You can always get to his grace. I wish somebody would give the Lord some high praise. Though millions have come, there's still room for one. There's room at the cross. And there's not a devil that could ever keep you from getting to the cross. I don't have time to veer off too much here tonight. I got a lot I want to share with you. But I have to just mention that demoniac of Gadarene. Commentaries tell us he had thousands of devils, 6,000, maybe as many as twelve filled with legions of devils. And yet the Bible says when he saw Jesus, he ran and worshiped him. Because one man that makes up his mind, your human will is more powerful than the devil. So you don't believe that, but you need to believe that. Your human, that man didn't have the Holy Ghost. He, has, he was possessed by devils. But he decided, even though he was demon-possessed, that he wanted to worship Jesus and 6,000 screaming devils couldn't stop him. What's stopping you? I promise you it's not the devil. He doesn't have that kind of power. All the legions of hell don't have that kind of power. All you've got to do is call out the name of Jesus. The cherubims are guarding the mercy. There'll be access granted to you. You can touch him if you want to. You can feel him if you want to. You can pray if you want to. You can worship if you want to. We can have as much revival as we want to have. We can sing as long as we want to sing. We can preach what we want to preach. We can pray any way we want to pray. We're doing exactly what we want to do tonight. There's no spiritual power holding us back. There's no force restraining us. We have the anointing of God. The angelic host is encamped around about us. The only problem we have is flesh. I talked to him a little bit about it in the leadership meeting the other night. I said, now, usually in America, demon-possessed people, we don't see them very often because as soon as they start acting up, we medicate them and put them in the hospital. <laughs> They're over in the asylum somewhere. 
So we don't see them much. But sometimes we do get people disrupting services and acting out and going all crazy. Most of the time in America, that's just flesh. That's not even the devil. Sometimes it's people on drugs and their minds all out of control. I said, here's how you know. If somebody's acting up and you command them in Jesus' name to stop, to be quiet, to stand still, if they don't do it, it ain't the devil. Because the devil has to obey. The devil has to listen. He has to obey apostolic authority. But flesh doesn't have to. You don't have to listen if you don't want to. We can say all stand. If you don't want to stand, you can just keep sitting down. There's nothing we can do about it. We can tell everybody sit down. If you want to stay standing, you can stand. There's nothing we can do about it. There's nothing we can do. You, you do what you want to do. You have human will. That's usually what we're dealing with. They, I was over in Ethiopia one time, and they brought a man. They called him a lunatic. He was demon-possessed. Brought him up on the platform, wanted me to pray for him. I started walking over there to him, and he was just a young man, uh, about maybe 17, 18, 19 years old. And as soon as I got close, he bowed up like he's going to spit on me. And about the time he was just getting ready to release, I said, stop. Don't you spit on me. Here's what he did. Kind of stunned me. I was like, okay. Not exactly sure what to do next, but that part worked. <laughs> Hallelujah. It's kind of a learning process here sometimes. I reached over. His arms were out. I reached over and put his arms down, pushed him back. I said, all right, can you talk? <laughs> we prayed for him. They brought a, you know, most people in America can't say my name. It's Kleindienst. And even the ones that can say it can't spell it. Over in Ethiopia, they tried to teach me to say praise the Lord in their language. I couldn't get it. But they brought a demon-possessed man up, strapped down to a stretcher. And when I walked over and looked down at him with his eyes rolling back in his head and foaming, he looked right up at me and said, Klein danced. I said, nice to meet you. But that's not the name that's going to help you. My name has no power. But I know a name that does. Come on, preachers, let's pray. In Jesus' name, that fella got delivered. They untook, unwrapped him from the ropes, stood him on his feet. We prayed him through the power of the Holy Ghost. And before he left, he got the microphone and testified of the goodness of Jesus. Somebody give the Lord a great hand, praise. Woo, there's a spiritual world out there. And you and I have power in it. Seraphims are celestial beings exalted with three pairs of wings. They're attendants of what the Bible calls the Lord of hosts. Lord of hosts. That's in the Bible 261 times. Translated from the Hebrew tongue, Yahweh Sabaoth, the Lord of armies. He's the Lord of heavenly armies. The seraphims are seen in Isaiah 6, standing above the throne of God. And the seraphims are declaring, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of of his glory. These seraphims are of the highest ranking angels and they call attention to the holiness and the glory of God. So that's why when we live a lifestyle of holiness, when we separate ourselves from the world in ungodliness and unrighteousness and we enter into this house trying to pursue and live a separated lifestyle of holiness, we begin to intermingle with these seraphims, and it starts to feel holy, holy, holy. The whole earth is full of his glory, holiness and glory of God. These are celestial angels that are filled with high praise. So when we come in the beauty of holiness and we begin worshiping and singing and loving God, I want you to know you are joining an angelic army. You're joining an angelic host. And our God is Yahweh Sabaoth. He is the Lord of that host. He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He is the mighty God. And there are 10,000 times 10,000 angels at his bidding. Yeah, there's demons. 
There's devils. I wrote a book on spiritual warfare, listing all the devils mentioned in the Bible, talking about what they do and how they operate and how to overcome them. But one thing you need to remember, for every one of them, there's two that didn't go astray. There's twice as many angels of light as there are demons of darkness. No wonder, no wonder the prophet said, greater are they that be with us than they that be with him. <laughs> Amen. The angelic host that is around us, camped around about us, is not only more powerful, but it outnumbers the demonic world two to one. I'm telling you, God is with us. We can expect victory. We can expect liberty. Maybe I'll just stop and say this. You don't need to be afraid of the devil. God has not given you the spirit of fear, but of love, power, and a sound mind. You don't have to be afraid of the devil. As a matter of fact, the devil is afraid of you. If you ever figure out the power you have, if you ever understand the power of the name Jesus, that if you believe in one God, you do well. The devils believe also and tremble. You have power to tread on serpents and on scorpions and over all the power of your adversary. They say, Brother Kleindance, have you ever been attacked by the devil? Yes, I have, especially early in my ministry. He doesn't seem like he wants a piece of me lately. He attacks from the darkness. He attacks from the edges. He sneak attacks, sniper attacks. He doesn't want to get close. But when I was young, coming out of the world, there was one night I woke up, felt like I had two knees on my chest. I felt pressure on my chest. I felt like something was had a hold of my throat. I tried to speak out, but I couldn't speak. It was like my voice was paralyzed. So I was laying there, realizing I was under some kind of an attack of the demonic. I could feel the spirit of fear all over the room, and I couldn't say anything. So in my mind, I started thinking, Jesus, Jesus, in the name of Jesus. By the time I got it out once, that devil was long gone. There's power in the name of Jesus. You ever feel any spirit of darkness? Just speak the name of Jesus. At the name of Jesus, every knee will bow. Every tongue confess. Jesus Christ is Lord. He's the Lord of glory. And there's not a devil in hell that doesn't know who he is. If you believe in one God, thou doest well. The devils believe also and tremble. This is a one God believing church. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. We are not confused tonight. We believe there's one God. We believe he came to earth in the form of man, in the body of Jesus Christ, and that God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself. And then that spirit that was in Christ came on the day of Pentecost and now dwells in us. Somebody shout yes. So they asked the old prophet, Prophet T.W. Barnes from down in Louisiana before he passed away. They said, Brother Barnes, when you go into a hotel room, do you cast out all the devils before you go to bed? The old prophet said, no. I'm one God, preacher. I believe in one God. If the devil wants to lay under my bed and tremble all night, it's up to him. That's the kind of attitude you need to have. Amen. So, Brother Klein, did you ever preach a church service where the devil's in the service? Sure I have. If he wants to sit in the back and tremble while we worship the Lord, that's his business. If he wants to shake in his shoes while we magnify the name of the Lord, that's his business. We're here to give glory and honor to the Lord Jesus Christ. We're here to sing about power, power in the blood of the Lamb. If he wants to stick around and hear about praises to his name, if he wants to hear about the power of the blood, if he wants to hear how we've been redeemed and called out of darkness into the light, that's his business. But you can put him on the run. I don't talk to devils. I don't ask them their name, where they're from. They lie anyway. What makes you think you ask a devil a question, they're going to tell you the truth? Devil couldn't tell the truth standing on the Bible looking at Jesus. And they're not so bad. According to the Bible, Jesus went into death, hell, and the grave and got the keys to death and hell. That means the devil doesn't even have the keys to his own house. The devil ain't so bad. You say, well, you're talking like that, you're going to fall off that platform. 
If I fall off this platform, it's because I'm nearsighted in one eye, half blind in the other. I didn't sleep good before I got here. I'm tired. I'm overweight. I'm out of shape. And I'm awkward. I ain't got nothing to do with the devil. If the devil could have killed me, he already would have. Don't you think talking like that, the devil going to kill you? No way. Amen. I believe if the devil could kill me, he'd already done it. Just thinking about it gets him excited. But I don't belong to him. I belong to the Lord Jesus Christ. I've been bought with a price. I've been bought with the blood of Calvary's cross. I'm by myself no match for the devil, but I'm not by myself. Greater is he that is in me. That's the power of the Holy Ghost than he that is in the world. To get to me, he's got to come through my Father. Hallelujah. I belong to the Lord. My life is in his hands. Somebody shout yes. There are ministering spirits mentioned in the Bible. Boy, I'm not getting very far. I got about a nine-hour message here tonight. Don't worry, I, I, I'll move quick. Ministering spirits. In Matthew 4, 11, the devil left him, and behold, angels came and ministered to him. Hebrews 1, 14, are, not, are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister to them who shall be heirs of salvation? I've had some ministering spirits come my way through the years. I was telling them the other night about being, I took a little nap. I was sort of halfway between awake and sleep, not all the way to sleep, not all the way awake. And the Lord began to minister to me some things that I ministered to the leaders. In that little in-between place, I've been in that place before sometimes in prayer. I didn't fall asleep, but I wasn't totally conscious. And as there that I feel like ministering angels have come, ministered to me physically, spiritually. There have been times when I've been in a very critical crisis situation, and the Lord, words would just come out of my mouth. And I'd wonder, well, I didn't even know that. How did I say that? I didn't know that information. I didn't know that to be true. I didn't know how to articulate that ever before. And it just came out. I believe that's the result of ministering spirits coming and ministering to us at times when we are not entirely conscious of that ministry. See, I believe in things like that. I believe that you're able to get lost in the Holy Ghost. I believe you can go out there in the spirit world and slip beyond the surly bonds of this old world and intermingle. We don't understand it all. We see through the glass darkly, but I'm pressing my face to the glass and I'm squinting my eyes and I'm trying to push through this little thin veil and see if I can just understand it a little bit better. The Bible speaks of prominent archangels. These are chief angels. No doubt you've heard of Gabriel. Gabriel was a messenger angel. It seems like the heavens were divided into thirds. And Gabriel seemed to be over a third of the angels in heaven. It was angel that showed up and said, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God. I'm sent to speak to thee. And thou shalt bring forth a son. He's talking to Mary. And thou shalt call his name Jesus. Do you understand we have the name of Jesus? Because it was given to Mary by the angel Gabriel. You don't believe in angels, you can't even believe we got the right name here. Because that's where it came from. It seemed like there are messenger angels that can talk to us, bring messages to us, speak things in our ear. Michael was a warring angel. Daniel fasted 21 days. The angel appeared unto him. And I love this part of the story. said, we heard you from the first day. We've made that 21-day Daniel fast almost magical. If I can just make it to the 21st day. I'm going to get my answer. I'm at day 19. If I can hang on two more days, the answer is going to come. That's not even Bible principle. The angel showed up on the 21st day, said, we heard you and we're on the way since the first day. But we were withstood by the prince of Persia and Michael had to come and assist us to get the victory. And once the warfare in heaven was won, then we were able to get to you and answer your prayer. Don't you feel if you're praying and the answer's not coming, that God didn't hear you, that you gotta somehow do something different? Just keep praying, just keep believing. There might be a war going on in the heavenly somewhere. And we got to stay faithful. Just keep singing till the answer shows up. Just keep praying till the answer shows up. Just keep being faithful till the answer. Come on, there's some spiritual warfare going on. Pastors have had to do this for years. They preach, they minister, they pray. They know there's warfare going on. But the answer's on the way. Woo! 
Somebody shout yes. yes. Then, of course, there's old Slewfoot himself, Lucifer, the fallen angel. Seemed like he was an angel of worship, an angel of glory that would accumulate all the praise and worship of the heavens with his angels and lift it up to the Lord. His voice was like a musical instrument. The Bible says that he had been in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was his covering. The workmanship of his tabrets and pipes was prepared in thee the day that the Lord created him. I like to picture it like these old traditional orthodox churches with the pipe organs. And they got all those pipes on two sides of various dimensions and tones. That's what the devil's voice is like. It's a musical instrument. That's why you don't need to be talking to the devil or his angels. They'll hypnotize you. They'll sing a pretty song. They can weave a beautiful conversation. They're like Pied Piper. They can make you believe things that are not true. They're full of deception. They're full of lies. They're full of deceit. He is a liar and the father of lies. And there's no reason to do anything except say, get thee behind me in the name of Jesus Christ. But I might mention one of the reasons the devil hates us so much is because when he got kicked out of heaven, he decided that he was going to lift his throne up above the throne of God and he was going to also be God. He got the revelation before we did. There's only one God. There'll only ever be one God. And you're not him and you can't be next to him. It's not God and the devil. If you understand where the devil is, the devil's a contemporary to Gabriel and Michael. There is no equal to God. He said, there are no gods beside me. I know not any. Amen. The devil hates you because when the heavens went silent, when the devil with his instrument and all his demon cohorts with all their beautiful voices got kicked out of heaven, God came on a mission to seek and to save that which was lost. That which was lost was worship. And God said, I'm going to take fallen humanity and I'm going to restore worship through these bag of bones and through these jars of clay. And it must be some barbaric thing to Lucifer, that high exalted being, when we begin to sing and play our instruments. And it must seem so rudimentary to him. We are carved out of the dust and we come out of sin and we come out of every kind of thing of this world. And now we've been born again, called out of darkness into this marvelous light that we should show forth his praises. And when we lift up our hallelujahs and we lift up our praise the Lord's, it happens in the heavens. Just like when he used to be there, we've replaced him. So he's jealous. So he knows the power. He knows what happens when people worship. The heavens begin to shift. The glory of God begins to be revealed. The anointing begins to fall. Things begin to go in the right direction. It's powerful when people begin to worship. Somebody shout hallelujah and watch what happens to this atmosphere. I got to hurry on. Angelic visitations all over the Bible. Angels were placed outside the Garden of Eden to guard the entrance. Three angels appear on the plains of Mamre. Two continued on to Sodom to bring destruction. Jacob's ladder was a stream of angels ascending and descending. The angel of the Lord appears in a flame of fire out of a burning bush and speaks before the Lord even spoke to Moses. We get ahead of ourselves. We talk about the burning bush and God was in the bush. But the Bible said that there was an angel of the Lord that appeared in the flame of fire. An angel went before Israel along with the pillar of cloud and by the pillar of fire. An angel appeared before Hagar to assist her in saving her son Ishmael. An angel caused Balaam's donkey to arrest the attention of a wayward prophet. There are instances of angels over and over appearing to Abraham and to Jacob. An angel protected Daniel through the night in the den of lions. An angel appeared to Gideon, inspiring him in the battle. An angel appeared both to Elizabeth, who birthed John the Baptist, and to Mary, who birthed the Lord Jesus Christ. An angel appeared to them in their pregnancies. An angel gave Mary the name of Jesus. An angel gave Zacharias the name of John for John the Baptist. An angel appeared to the shepherds directing them to the manger where Jesus would be born. 
An angel appeared to Cornelius telling him to call for the apostle Peter and he would tell him what they needed to do to be saved. An angel appears to the apostle Peter and delivers him out of jail and even leads him out into the city. Jesus prays in the garden of Gethsemane and angels come and minister to him and strengthen him. An angel appears to Philip sending him south to the Ethiopian eunuch. An angel told Paul he will survive the shipwreck and appeal to Caesar. An angel appears to the apostle John on the Isle of Patmos and gives him a prophetic book that would become the book of the revelation of Jesus Christ and reveal the great harlot mystery of Babylon. I'm telling you tonight, I feel like there is a host of the angelic all around us. I can hear them in my spiritual ears crying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. Would you like to use your voice and join that heavenly host right now? Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. Surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. I can feel His mighty power and His grace. I can feel the brush of angels' wings. I see glory on each face. Surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. We are in the presence of supernatural power, anointing. We sit in heavenly places tonight. The only words we find in the Bible attributed to Michael, the warring angel, was when he spoke directly to the devil and said, The Lord rebuke you. Satan's attack on Job was relentless, but it was centered on his worship. Satan said, I'll get him to curse you to your face, but he never did because we have been called to be a worshiper of the Lord Jesus Christ. I am telling you, God is moving this church into some powerful places. He is moving us into a dimension where we better get ready. Signs, wonders, miracles, visions, dreams, gifts of the Spirit, and angelic visitations are coming to us. Jesus looked down through the telescope of time and said, when I come, will I find faith on the earth? And I'm here to tell you in the midst of this end time chaos, in the midst of this end time deception, in the midst of the spirit of Antichrist, we are holding fast to our profession of faith. We are apostolic people. We can never give over to a form of godliness and deny the power. We need something that comes down from heaven like a rain, a latter rain from heaven watering the dry, thirsty soil of our heart. We need more than we can produce with music, more than we can produce with logos, more than we can produce with oratory. We need the anointing of the Almighty God. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty to the Spirit, to the pulling down of strongholds. So I am here to declare to tonight that energy is not enough we need the anointing religion is not enough we need the experience passion is not enough loud voices are not enough gymnastics is not enough biblical knowledge and academic knowledge is not enough inspirational music is not enough ornate buildings with the latest sound and the latest video equipment it's not enough Thank God the new carpet's coming next week. We're enjoying the beautiful new lights. There are going to be some more lights going up on some back walls. There's been some new paint. Thank God for all of it, but none of it is enough. Buildings can't bring it. Money can't bring it. Community influence won't bring it. Polished presentations, profound oratory, tweetable quotes, not enough, not enough, not enough. Social media presentations and promotion, not enough. Innovative branding, not enough evangelistic campaigns, not enough. You cannot win a battle in the flesh that's begun in the spirit. You can see energy, but you can feel an awning. We need that something that captivates us and says, I feel it. I feel it. We used to sing a song in the old Pentecostal church, said, I feel it. I feel it. This Pentecostal blessing, and I know, I know it's real. You can feel it in your hands. You can feel it in your feet. You can feel it in your heart. 
Sometimes it feels like chill bumps on the back of your neck. Sometimes it feels like a fire shut up in your bones. Sometimes it feels like warmth running all over your body. Sometimes it feels like you got a little lightheaded as the burdens begin to lift off you. But this is not just something we see or know. It's something we feel. And tonight, I can feel the brush of angels' wings in this house. Somebody shout hallelujah. Hey, somebody shout hallelujah. Let us take a minute and just worship the Lord right here. I'm close to finish. <sighs> Let me get us ready. Wow. Wow. When my, when my wife was a child... 11 years old. Her family was extremely poor. At one point, her and her brothers and sisters and all, they lived in a station wagon car. They would park by a river and wash their clothes in the river and wear them to school. There were times they all had to eat one meal out of a single can of food. My wife talks about many times being hungry, not having clothes, being made fun of in school. They were so desperately poor. Her father was a dairy farmer, and he worked on farms, and one time they just, he got a, a new assignment, new job, went into the old farmhouse, but the electricity wasn't on yet. And so they got in the old farmhouse and it was cold and the bus was picking up my wife and her sister, Brother Libby's church over there in Gaithersburg, Maryland, bringing them to Bible study. And they went to church that night and heard a message and the preacher was talking about praying and talking to God. And they got home from the Bible study, their mother informed them there's no food. You're just going to have to go to bed, wear your clothes because we have no heat. And we're going to try to work something out. My wife remembers that night hearing her brother go down the hall and crying because he was so hungry. She was hungry. Her sister was hungry. But she had been to church and they said you could pray and talk to God. So she said, I laid there in the bed and said, Lord, we're hungry. We need food. We don't know what to do. I shouldn't give away all her thunder, but she talks about the kids at school having chocolate. And she didn't ever had tasted any, she asked the Lord for some chocolate. said, early the next morning, it was a wintry Maryland night. By sunrise the next morning, her mother was calling up the stairs all their names, Patricia, Ann, Barbara, Alice, Bucky, Lee, Ray, get down here. said, we all went running down the steps. The old farm door was open. Snow was everywhere. There was no tracks in the snow. There was no footprints. We had no telephone. Nobody even knew where we were. We said we were two miles off the road. We said, but there was bags of groceries lined all up on the porch. And she said, sure enough, in those bags was a couple bags of chocolate. Before there was Uber Eats, I believe there was Angel Eats. You believe it any way you want to believe it. I believe God can send the angelic host shopping if they if he needs to. We've entertained angels unaware. Early in my pastorate in Lynchburg, Virginia, I was starting to do a little bit of travel. I'd only been one or two places outside the country in those days. I was up late one night praying, talking to the Lord about one or two o'clock in the morning. Gets real peaceful about that time because all the people with devils go to sleep. And devils need people to work through. And I was praying angel appeared in my living room over by the door taller than the door thin no sword no shield no helmet wasn't a warring that's all I'd ever seen very stately very distinguished looking tall I said Lord I see this angel but I don't know what it is I don't know and the Lord said it's an ambassador angel I didn't know there were ambassador angels ambassador angel that will go before you into every nation you go to the rest of your ministry and will negotiate the terms of your arrival you will go nowhere if this ambassador doesn't go before you get there and dictate the terms of the engagement that you will be involved in. And all I can tell you is these many years later, all the countries and places and dangerous situations I've been in, in Nigeria and Pakistan and India and the Philippines and on and on goes the list. God's been with me. And there's been times the situation turned around in ways I don't even know how it happened. But my ambassador was there. I see angels kind of like... I don't have any glass up here, but if there was a window or glass and you're looking through it, 
You can see your reflection in the glass, but you can see through it. Many times that's the way I see angels. One time, my wife, we were living in the basement of the church in Virginia, building the church there, and I was getting ready to go to Ethiopia, and my wife was very fearful in those days. She's over her fear now, but she had a spirit of fear in those days about being alone and by herself. And so she was very anxious the night before I was getting ready to leave. She's prayed for a while and then came to bed, but in the middle of the night, she said she got up to go use the restroom. She came back, and she said, you were asleep. You were turned toward the wall. But she said, standing over you was this very muscular, tall man with his hands folded, and he was just staring right down into your face. The fact that she did not jump through the wall, <laughs> miracle all by itself. I said, you mean you saw it in your mind? She said, no, it was a real person just right there, just uh, clear, as, clear as a human being. She said, he just was studying, staring down into your face like this. And I said, what'd you do? She said, I felt such a peace. I just got in bed and went to sleep. I said, you went to sleep with him there? She said, I did. I knew that was a miracle from God. But it was a comfort to let her know the angel of the Lord had showed up and was with us in that trip. One time I was getting ready to go to Nigeria. And she said, I saw a vision. And the Lord told me something to tell you. said, you're going to arrive. And she said, I saw you walking down a long hallway. And she said, there's going to be an angel that's going to show up in the airport. And he's not going to speak to you, but he's going to smile at you. And when you see that big smile, you'll know not to be afraid in Nigeria. The angel's with you. Well, it's a long trip to Nigeria. And I showed up very late at night and tired, and I forgot the story. And I got off the airplane. I was going down this long, vacant hallway on one of those uh, moving sidewalks. And I wasn't even walking. I was so tired. I was just holding on to the deal and letting it carry me. And as I was motorcading on down through there, and I was just looking up. I look over and over by a desk that was sitting there, a podium. There was a man, very stately dressed, very exquisite looking. And he was just leaning up against it. And as I strolled by, he gave me a big old giant smile. And when I saw that smile, I felt like somebody poured cold water on my head. I remember what my wife told me. I just nodded at him and turned and knew I was going to be all right. I'm telling you, folks, there's more going on than what we're aware of. Another trip, I went to Nigeria. I took a gentleman with me from Mississippi. He was an old bricklayer. He was kind of a tough guy. And we showed up, and we were in that airport in Nigeria. And let me tell you something. They will scam you if they can, and they will take your money. And uh, it, it's a pretty dangerous place to go. And we got in there, and we were at the luggage rack waiting for our luggage. And we were the only two white people in the whole place. We looked like Casper the Friendly Ghost. And we were watching the door over there where everybody was going out. And everybody that was leaving, the guards with their guns were coming by, checking their tickets, looking at their luggage, screaming and yelling and having arguments and arms were flailing. They were sending them off. Guards would come and get them, carry them off to a room somewhere, and we don't know what happened to them. And then somebody else would go up, and it was all kinds of chaos and confusion. And he said, what are we going to do? I said, that's the only way out. And I said, it's pretty reasonable to assume they're going to notice us. <laughs> our luggage arrived. He said, I said, here we go. I said, we got our luggage. We walk up there. Maybe about as wide, a little bit wider than this platform was the doorway out. There's a guard right there, bullets and gun. Guard right here, bullets and gun. We walk up and stand, and we're ready for it to begin. And they're just looking around. We're standing there, and I'm trying to catch eye contact, and they look right at me and just look past me. Finally, I said, bro, they can't see us. He said, what do you mean? I said, we're invisible. Look. They don't know we're here. I said, let's go. We walked right between them. And as we got between them, I felt like I walked through a waterfall. Got out on the other side. They never even spoke to us. You believe what you want to believe. I believe my ambassador showed up and said, you're going to have to leave them two alone. Woo! It is all happening in the invisible world. But the angels of the Lord are encamped around about them that fear him. We better let our musicians come up here and give you a little hope tonight. You might not believe it, but I've skipped 
all kinds of stuff in this message. <laughs> I didn't realize I had a whole epistle. <laughs> I had a whole book. I had a whole book of the Bible up here tonight. I want to close with this. There's a story in the Old Testament about a king named Jehoshaphat. He was going into a warfare. And then right before they went into the warfare, Pastor, somebody in the congregation, a man named Jehazel, prophesied, said, you'll not need to fight in this battle. The Lord will fight for you. Have no fear. The Lord is with you. And he will fight the battle for you. Well, the old king said, well, if we're not going to need to fight, put all the warriors and bruisers in the back and get me some singers. Get me some musicians. Because if we're not going to war, we may as well worship. Now, I've got a good book on spiritual warfare. You can buy it on Amazon. It's 114 pages. But if you want me to give you the secret to it all, if you will worship more, you will warfare less. Because God said, I'd rather you be worshiping than warring. So while you're warring, I'll fight the battle. So they went singing their way into the battle. They went worshiping their way into the battle. And the Bible says the Lord sent ambushments against their enemy. So out of nowhere comes ambushments against their enemy, the Syrians, and they begin to just kill each other. They got so paranoid and so confused, they just started killing each other. I don't know what the last guy did, looked around, everybody else was dead. I guess he just ran himself through. There was no battle to fight. The Lord said ambushments. And I got to thinking about them ambushments. You know what an ambush is? It's a surprise attack. They were hiding in the bushes. They were hiding behind the door. They were hiding behind the car. Nobody knew they were there. And the ambush comes when they come out of nowhere. Tonight I'm reminding you these angels are the invisible agents and ambassadors of the Lord. And just when the devil thinks he has us cornered, just when he thinks there's no way out, just when it looks like there's no escape, just when Moses and the children of Israel are backed up to the sea with mountains on every side and Pharaoh's army coming down, the angel shows up with a pillar of fire. It's an ambush. I'm here to tell you tonight I feel in the Holy Ghost that the Lord has ordained an ambush on behalf of the Norfolk Apostolic Church. All you have to do is worship. Would you stand with me across the house? All they had to do was sing. All they had to do was worship. All they had to do was shout with the voice of triumph. And while they were worshiping, out of nowhere came the invisible host. And it was an ambush on the adversary. I feel like we ought to launch an ambush tonight, don't you? I know it took a little time to give you some Bible, but there's power in that word. It's not just my idea. This is what God is doing. I feel like we ought to launch an ambush here tonight. If you want to help with the ambush, if you need an ambush against the adversary attacking your family, I want you to come up here and stand right now. If you're going to help with the ambush, come up here. Woo! If you're ready to put the devil on the run, if you're ready for the angels of the Lord to be encamped around about your life, come up here and stand. We're going to launch an ambush. Mm. Y'all get ready with some of that shouting ambush music. We're going to need it in a minute. I've been doing this a long time. I know what I feel in this house tonight. There's about to be a Holy Ghost explosion. And when the ambush happens, people are going to get healed, delivered, loosed. The joy of the Lord is going to be your strength. The anointing is going to destroy the yoke. So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to speak a word of faith. You've seen it. You've been a part of it. You've done it before. But when I speak this word of faith and shout hallelujah, that high praise, 
that hallelujah that's going to ascend up into the heavens and fill the whole heavens with the glory of the Lord. When we shout hallelujah, the Lord of hosts is going to stand up off the throne. The angels of the Lord are going to be released. And it's going to be an ambush against the forces of darkness in your life. He's going to ambush out of the spirit realm. The devil never knew it was coming. So I want you to close your eyes. Get your mind right on the Lord. And get ready to help me with a shout. When you hear me shout hallelujah, I'm asking every person in this house to lift your head up toward heaven. Shout a hallelujah with everything inside of you. And you may want to shout it three or four or five or six or eight times. It's somewhere in here the ambush is going to be released. The anointing is going to break the yokes. The victory is going to come. The pain is going to leave your body. The depression and fear is going to lift off of you. The Lord's about to set an ambush. By the authority of the word of God. And by the power of the name Jesus, I release the angelic host and the people of God to have victory in battle tonight. Hallelujah! It's a Holy Ghost ambush. Launch us some shout music. I said it's a Holy Ghost ambush. While you're worshiping, while you're dancing, while you're leaping for joy, the Lord is fighting your battle.
weapons we use are not bombs and guns. Worship is the way the battle is won. I got the victory. I got 
worship the Lord. Come on and worship the Lord. We thank you for the victory. 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 Hallelujah. Yes. Hallelujah. Oh, we worship you, Jesus. We worship you, Jesus. We worship you, Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Lord, hallelujah. Hallelujah. <laughs> Come on, his anointing is flowing right now. Come on, step into the spirit. Come on. You've been trying to fight it yourself, uh, but God sent in some help. She cut On his presence is here. There's a helper that's in this place. She Come on. Just begin to let it tap in. begin to worship her. Uh, there's some that are still in that spiritual healing. I, I wonder if we could just tap in a little bit deeper. She Thank 
And he's here. Just let him pour into you right now. Come on. We've shouted, but I want to feel that rain just begin to pour on me. Let that oil continue to flow. Come on, his presence is here. She cut Come on, we need to be like sponges. Let it saturate. Let it get down into our spirits. She cut There's more for you than against you. Hallelujah. some victories being won right now. Come on. God's doing more than we can do. While you're here right now, he's sending angels to fight that battle. She cut that lost loved one, he's sending somebody there right now while we're, fa- while we're waiting in his presence. Uh,
Come on up. Come on, we don't have to rush through this right here. Come on, just lay the battle down in his hands. Let him fight the battle while we worship. He's here. His spirit's moving. Come on, your strength is coming right here. She That peace you've been seeking is here. She 
prophet had a helper and when they were surrounded he became fearful but the prophet didn't pray that God would deliver them out of the situation he just prayed that God would open his eyes so that he could see that there was more for them than were against them. I'm thankful for Brother Kleinders that came in to show us we've been in the fight, but he wanted us to open our eyes and see that we have more on our side than we do against. I can't help but imagine that that is what David saw because when he was confronted with Goliath, he never ran to Goliath. It said he ran to the army of the Philistines. Now, either you got to be crazy or you have to see something that nobody else could see. You go into those hopeless situations. How do you got joy? How do you have peace? So I can see something that you can't see in the natural. The Bible says that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. They're not natural, but they are mighty through God. It's time to get our eyes off of what we just see in the natural. But God, to pull the blinders off that we can see the angels that are coming to help. Amen. I mean, imagine tomorrow morning you go to work. I'm speaking to myself now because I be in the battle. You go to work, and I'm excited because I know I'm going to win. Oh, yeah, I, I know I'm going to succeed because I can see the host of heaven. Ah, she cut my I wonder if one more time we could just begin to just lift up our hands and just let, let his spirit continue to just minister because we're going to win. I, God, let me be able to see your hand moving in our situations, God. Let me be able to see uh, the angels that are moving around, uh, that are coming to assist with the mission uh, that you have put us on. Uh, that we will not fail, God, but we can succeed. She cut Come on. Uh. Just let them wash that spirit over you. Uh. It's going to be all right. Uh. You're going to be more than a conqueror. You can do all things through Christ. Uh. You're going to make it, you're going to win. She cut Maha. She cut She cut her. She cut her. She God, we're 
We're ready for you, Jesus. We're coming to the end of ourselves, God. Let's respond to the word of the Lord. God, whatever I need to clear out, God, let me clear it out so that I can be full of you, Lord God. Come on. Let's be empty. God, so you can fill me up, Lord God. No, no, no. 
Hallelujah. Come on, we've been eating the junk of the world. We've been feeding. Whose report will you believe? Come on. We've been filling up on what they've been feeding, what they've been pouring out. But I want what God has been speaking. I want what he has for me. She cut she cut She cut Hallelujah. She cut Hallelujah, hallelujah. Mm. God's presence is so sweet. This is the atmosphere that we can create at home. It says if we live in the spirit, we walk in the spirit. There, right now, there's so much peace. There's so much richness of his spirit that's happening right now. We can experience this every day. But we have to do what the Lord just said. We have to fill up on the table that he has prepared for us. I'm not eating of the fear of the world. I want that peace that passes all understanding. I want that victory. I want that joy. Hallelujah. One more time, if we could just lift our hands and just thank the Lord. Uh, he's just, he's met us here today. I'm thankful, Jesus. I could have been anywhere, God, but I'm where you have been moving, where you've been speaking. I'm thankful for your presence, God. I want y'all to get that in your spirit. You can make it. You will win the fight. You are victorious. I want you to think about what a conqueror does. They go in, no matter the opposition, they take over. The Bible says we're more than conquerors. What is the opposition? Don't matter. I'm going to conquer. What's the obstacle? Doesn't matter. I'm going to win. You can make it. You can win. You're going to be victorious. The battle is already won. I want you to wake up tomorrow thinking that, saying that. Thank you, Jesus, for another victory that's won. But KJ, I haven't made it through the day yet. It don't matter. Thankful, Jesus, for the day. It's already won. Hallelujah. As our bishop says, greet one another, love one another. If you want to stay in this presence, we're going to keep the atmosphere for you to stay here. 
If you need to go, you can go, but you are victorious. Leave with your head held high because you already won. Hallelujah. Be blessed in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah.